Good morning to each and every one. Thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, who is Yahweh, Hello, Heaven. Tristan, the Ashton, who is to be with you once again this morning. Thank you, Lord, for his love. Thank you, for his grace. More or less, more so, thank you, for this divine vision and revelation that he has given to us, mankind, through the body of Dr. Helen Luther Kelly, for the saving of our souls. We do at this time invite and encourage each and every one to be a part of this divine lecture this morning. Sincerely we pray that one is serious and one is seriously searching and looking for the truth today. And for this reason, Yahweh has given this divine vision and revelation that you and I might come to know him as he really is and as he actually exists. Welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research and Cooperation. This is a non-profit, non-international, religious and scientific organization. This is a school and it is not a church. And neither are we affiliated to any other religious or scientific organization. This school is founded based on a spiritual vision and revelation given to a man Dr. Henry Clifford Kenny in the state of Ohio in the year 1921. Your school is set up headquarters in Trinidad, and I'm your school official dean, I'm Dr. Clifford Williams. In this school, we preach and we teach using the true, correct, original, and only the word of God and the heavenly Father, which is Yahweh. The word of Son, which is Telegram, and the Holy Spirit, which is Yahshua, as contained in the original Hebrew manuscripts. When scripture translators or Bible translators came across the true divine name of the heavenly Father, which is Yahweh, they were wrongly inserted the common title of the Lord. When they came across the true divine dualistic title for the word of Son, which is Elohim, they wrongly gave us the common title of God. And when they came across the true name of the Holy Spirit, which is Yahshua, whether manifested in or out of a physical body, they gave us the pagan strategy of Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5, it states, For though there be that are called gods, spelled with the S, showing that there are many of them, whether these gods are in heaven or in the earth, as they are God's men and God's men. Each God must have a name, and each Lord must have a name also. So the question one should ask oneself, what is the name of the creator of the world? See that Lord and Lord are titles and not names. In the Greek mythology, there are many gods. There is Hercules, the god of strength, Venus, the god of love, and Neptune, the sea god. Hercules, Venus, and Neptune are their names, was the title added on to it. In England, we have a place called the House of Lords. And at the House of Lords, there are such lords as Lord Baltimore, Lord Snowden, Lord Chesterfield, just the name of two. Baltimore, Snowden, and Chesterfield are their names, Lord of the Title, bestowed on them by the monarch of England. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous or wrong name. A minor investigation of your part into a good on a rich dictionary or encyclopedia, you will come across these following factors of truth for yourself. That up to this day, there is no J in Hebrew. There is no character or symbols in Hebrew. When translated into letter to letter, some of the sounds of the symbol comes close to or resemble that of you and I to get the J. There is no J in Hebrew up to this day. Neither is there a letter J in the Greek alphabet, the Latin alphabet. There, is no, there was no J in the Russian. 
at the time of the birth of the Messiah. And when you examine the letter the liturgy, you will realize that the liturgy came about for the first time, or came into existence for the first time within the 17th century, 17, 18, 19, 20, which was 400 years or four centuries. So the liturgy can be given 400 years in its total existence on the face of his Lord. Bearing in mind, the true statement of the Lord is Yahshua, what is stood for 2,000 years ago. And the liturgy is only 400 years. So when you take the 400 from the 2,000, we get 1,600 years. So the claim is being made, really, that it took 1,600 years after the birth of Yahshua Messiah, after the fulfillment of his ministry, after his death, burial, and resurrection, and the appointment of the Holy Spirit, it took 1600 years after that to name him. The question lies who named somebody 1600 years after their death. Totally impossible. Likewise, the first man that Yahweh revealed his name to is a man you know to be called Moses, who is truly Moshe. His name truly is Moshe, which means to be drawn out. And Yahweh revealed his name to Moses at the backside of Mount Sinai, and that took place 4,000 years ago, and the letter J is only 400. So when we take the 400 from the 4,000, we get 3,600 years. So it was totally impossible for Yahweh to have told anybody, Moses or anybody, that his name is Jehovah. So such things as Jesus, John, Joshua, Jehovah, are impossible renderings of those names. In the name Jesus, J E is originally I E. When pronounced, it is pronounced E O D, which is the name of a Babylonian god. The part S-U-S comes from Zeus, the supreme god of the Greeks. And Christ, which is a title, comes from Krishna, the Hindu Sanaidal god, which is the worship of the physical sun that we see in the sky or in the interior heavens, day by day. So in the name of Jesus, you have a Babylonian god, a Greek god, and a Hindu god. Three pagan gods or three different gods of three different nationalities. The true, correct, original, and only name of your mind, Heavenly Father, is Yahweh. The name Yahweh comes from the original Hebrew text of Ramadan. Text your meaning called one, two, three, four. And Ramadan represents or symbols in Hebrew, which are your case for me. The Hebrew language constant in the language in that they do not use the aid of vowels to make the words pronounceable. So as represented by these four characters, it is pronounced Yahweh by the Hebrew speaking people. The Hebrew language is read from right to left, unlike that of the English language that is read from left to right. So when the Hebrew text of Ramadan is transliterated letter for letter, song for song, symbol for symbol. This is a Y, this is an H, this is a W, and this is an H. In order to make the, the text of Ramadan pronounce pronounceable Yahweh in English, as it is pronounced Yahweh by the Hebrew speaking people, we as English speaking people, we need the aid of all vowels to make our words pronounceable. And these vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y taking the place of that. Through the divine vision and revelation, it was revealed in order to know which power to use and where to place it. That one must go to the first man, Adam, that was drawn out of virgin mother earth, using the holy power in his name, which is the A, placing it between the Y and the H to make pronounce the Yah, the masculine portion of our heavenly father's name.
you are further instructed to go to the first human being that was drawn out of the man Adam, using the only formula in first name, which is the age, placing it in the definite age to make pronounced for way the feminine portion of our heavenly father's name. You are my heavenly father, whose true, correct, original, and only name is Yahweh, is both male and female in principle, right within itself. And we, being his offspring, we do testify that this is true, because right within our physical knowledge, whether we be man or woman, we possess both male and female glands called hormones. The male gland or hormone that is in everybody's body is called androgen, symbolized by A. Show you proof that the A is correctly placed between the Y and the H to make pronounced by Yah, the masculine portion of our Heavenly Father's name. The female gland or hormone that is in everybody's body is called estrogen, symbolized by E. Show you proof that the E is correctly placed between the W and the H to make pronounced the way the feminine portion of our Heavenly Father's name. So whether we be man or woman, we possess both androgen and estrogen right within us. In a man, there's a greater percentage of androgen and a smaller percentage of estrogen. In a female, there's a greater percentage of estrogen and a smaller percentage of androgen. Testing by the Yahweh, who's male and female in principle, right within himself, and made mankind just like he is, with the male and female forms to represent him right within us. Elohim, which is a word of son, is Yahweh's divine pluralistic title. Elohim is the divine title that Yahweh chose for himself, unlike that of Lord and God. And EL in Hebrew theology, it means Yah. So there's a relationship between Yahweh and Elohim, Yah and Yah. When you turn your Bible to so called John 5 43, the same in the word when the Lord came into his ministry stated, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Say, if another or let another come in his own name, him you will receive. Well, the word is living up to that prophecy up to this day. From a natural standpoint, a natural child when it is birth into this creation takes on the natural surname of the natural parent. If that parent's surname is Smith, Jones, or Lewis, that child is automatically curly called Smith, Jones, or Lewis. Likewise, the same in the book. He said, I'm coming my father's name. So he has come taking the masculine portion of the heavenly father's name, which is Yah. And the next part of his name, which is pronounced Shua, in Hebrew theology, it means salvation. So his name is Yah, Shua. Yah, the short form for Yahweh, and Shua meaning salvation, showing the purpose to which he came into the world to save mankind from their sins. Now they have taught us that it is Jesus that is saying, I am coming my father's name. See, as he erroneously put into the Bible by your translator. And the tell us is Jesus is saying that I'm coming my father's name. So let us be broad minded and see that it's possible that it could have been Jesus saying that 2,000 years ago. Bearing in mind there is no change or the sound of the letter J at the time of the birth of the Messiah until some 1600 years. But we will leave that from the side and let's still examine it. Now the thought of the Heavenly Father's name is Lord or Jehovah. Some say Allah, some say Buddha, and whatever might be accepted from one culture to the other. See, because it's very important for us to understand it. So when we go to Lord, not only is Lord not a name, but it's a title. 
But when we get into the etymology of where the root meaning of where the word Lord derived from, we will find that Lord has come from Adonai, it has come from Mola, it has come from Baal, and Baal certainly has come from Belzebub, Belzebub, which is the chief of demons or the prince of demons. You may know him by, by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or the dragon. So that is where the term Lord comes from. So while one might be innocently using it, it is time to know the truth. That is where that film Lord comes from. It's pure satanic. See? Then you go to God. Not only is God a title, but the term God has come from the Germans who spell it G-O-T-T, which is God coming from Gothic, which is not nothing that is holy. The Assyrians borrowed it from the Germans and spelled it, spelled it G A W D, and the English borrowed from the Assyrians and spelled it G O D. And if you read it from right to left, you get something else. See? Then some say it's Jehovah. At the time of the Messiah's birth, there was no J or no sound of the letter J, no part of the world. Not just only in Hebrew, but no part of the world, and no language in the world was the letter J. At the time of Moses, all the saints in the world was Yahshua. There was no J, nor the sound of the letter J in no language. So it is impossible for the creator for Jesus to come in his father's name. And there's no resemblance with Jesus and Jehovah. There's no resemblance either with Lord and Lord and Jesus. See? So truly it is Yahshua who is saying, I am coming in my father's name. See? When you go to Allah, there's no resemblance with Allah and Jesus. Likewise, Buddha and the rest of them. So truly it is Yahshua the Messiah there 2,000 years ago saying, I am coming my father's name, taking on that masculine portion of the heavenly father's name which is Yah, and sure meaning salvation. And in Acts 4 and 12 states, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Save it in the name of Yahshua and Yahshua alone. I want to turn your attention to this child here. This child is called the Mosaic child. And on this child, Yahweh, which is pure spirit, is symbolized by a cloud. But Yahweh, which is pure spirit, state is not a cloud. We only use this cloud to depict Yahweh, the seed of the cloud. Has no discernible shape and form. Does this is orange and fiery color flower extend through all the dimensions of this chart and everything on this chart combines within the orange and fiery color flower? So, to in principle, all in like mind, does everything in the universe and the sum total of this creation abide within the pure spirit state of Yahweh? Because Yahweh is the ultimate source, substance of Yahweh is the limits. And the bones of all things. It is within Yahweh to live and move and have all being. As some of your poets have said, for we are also Yahweh's portions. Yahweh knows that man could not perceive of it or understand him in his pure spirit state. Focus right within himself to take on a super incorporeal shape and form, that is, having the shape and form of a man. Yet before flesh and blood, that he incited the army Elohim, which is the word of Son. This way is heavenly and should the world be in the hour of Elohim, is the archive, for he is the original pattern of the universe. It is in the hour of Elohim. In that same vision to Moses on top of Mount Sinai, in the year 1490 BBY, showed Moses. How he is comprised in part, not in totality, of this nine divine principle attribute of Yahweh in an organized shape and form. 
divine wisdom, divine knowledge from divine intelligence. Divine love, divine justice, divine beauty, divine formation, divine strength, and divine power. After Yahweh had Moses to do the children of Israel of the Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai. We are in Yahweh Elohim. Instantaneously transformed himself into the street court, thoroughly furnished tabernacle pattern or sanctuary that is, which consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court from above. One, two, three compartments, but one tabernacle pattern. We go about in this world to prove that everything in the universe is made and operates and is dictated according to the structure and function of this divine tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Yahweh alone also showed Moses how he created the heavens and the earth according to this divine tabernacle pattern, and he showed Moses the creation of coming out by the side. Yahweh Elohim could only be seen in divine vision and sometimes accompanied by divine revelation. I was given to the so called journal to the Isle of Patmos in the year 1896, in which we wrote in the so called Prophets and John, chapter 1, beginning at the first verse to say, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. Same was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things was made by him, Yahweh Elohim. And without him, Yahweh Elohim was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was and still is the life of the life of man. Finally, Yahweh Elohim manifested himself in the physical shape and form of a man inside the Yahshua Messiah, who the religious will wrongly or ignorant because Jesus Christ. This is further verified that same so called book of John, chapter 1, begins at the 14 verse states, and the word Yahweh Elohim was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we declare his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. In this school, we have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives to follow. One, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so called law of nature and the powers later to man, for to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science, to escapade current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal force, operating through the dispensation and ages. Seven, to discern, and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, and Satan, and his demons, operating the victory of iniquity on earth to the dispensation of time. In to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered on the sun. Nine, to be known that Yahweh, from the beginning of it, there is no other name under heaven given among them, whereby we must be saved. Save it in the name of Yahshua the Messiah and Yahshua the Messiah. And 10. To inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new world state. Our watch will speak and our slogan is to speak the truth.
with a view in Ezekiel, the eighth chapter. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month of the year, in the sixth month, in the fifth year of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judea sat before me, that the hand of Yahweh Elohim fell there upon me. Then I made there, and lo, in likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins, even downwards, fire, and from his loins, even upwards, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth, and he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by the lock, and my head, and the lock of my head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of Elohim to Jerusalem. To the door of the inner gate that looked towards the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoked to jealousy. And behold, the glory of Elohim, of the Elohim of Israel, was there, according to the vision that I saw in the gate. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now, the way towards the north. So I lifted up my eyes, the way towards the north. And before the north was at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? In the great abominations that the house of Israel committed, committed here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig no in the wall. And when I had dug or dig in the wall, behold the door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold, and behold the wicked abominations that they do, that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of evil things. And abominable peace, abominable peace, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall around about. And there stood before them seventy men of an ancient of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Yazanah, the son of Shaphan, with every man the censer in his hand, and a thick cloth of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, Yahweh saved us not. Yahweh had forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for tongues. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen? This, O son of man, 
Till and yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination and scandalous. And he brought me into the inner court of, the, of Yahweh's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of Yahweh, of Yahweh between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of Yahweh, and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. Then, said, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a right thing to the house of Judah that they commit abominations with their, which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch in the nose. Therefore will I also be in you. My eyes shall not stare, neither will I have feet. And though they cry in my ears with a low voice, yet will I not hear. Here ended Ezekiel the eighth chapter. As we have read, we see that Ezekiel is being given a vision. And he's given this vision about how the, the elders of Judah, the religious leaders, the priests of Judah, how they have turned their backs against Yahweh. And they will worship him all abominable idols and creeping things, provoking Yahweh to jealousy or to anger. More so, see, they behave in, a, in such a manner that they think Yahweh is not in charge of the earth anymore, that they have taken it over. See, it correctly states that they're behaving as though Yahweh had forsaken the earth. See, and one of the abominable things he saw, you see, saw that how the children of Israel and the elders were worshiping Tammuz. So then I will need to get some information about who Tammuz is. See? Now at this point in time, within the cultures, the religious cultures around the world, there are those religious cultures who are celebrating what is known to be called Easter. Now there is no part of the Bible that is, you see that Yahweh have given instructions to anybody, whether the children of Israel or anybody else. He hasn't given any instructions about the celebration or the worship of Easter. You cannot find that in the Lord of the Prophets. Because that would as I say, 8 and 20. He said, You go to the Lord and you go to the testimony. And I told you that the law is the first five books of the Bible from Genesis to Deuteronomy. The testimony is the next 24 books of the Bible. They say from Joshua to Yah, to Malachi. And there is no J in Hebrew, so that person's name is Yahshua to Malachi. And those are the scriptures that Yahweh gave the children of Israel. See, the law and the prophets. 
Now you will have the other parts of the Bible that you do read. See, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you have the letters. See, those letters, which is called epistles, epistles, you have the Paul's epistles, you see, you have Peter epistles, and epistles means letters. See, that they with the Holy Spirit was instructing the various assemblies and things that they need to know and understand, even chastising them. See, so we have the Bible, and we have not as it was originally given, anyhow, because as we have been showing you, they have taken out the name of the creator Yahweh Elohim and his son's name out of the book. So they have tarnished it already. Here, if you go to Revelation, Revelation tell you anybody that interfere with anything, anything in this book, in the original manuscript, Yahweh is going to take the name out of the book. If you take anything out of the book, the original manuscript, or if you add anything there, Yahweh will add the place that is in this book. See, it's very serious. So, all to the original scriptures, there is serious penalty. And somebody might ask why the world is in such a condition it is in. See? However, I don't want to uh, sidetrack myself this morning. So we have the law of the prophecy. And when you go into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will tell us about the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the Great Commission. That Yahshua gave his disciples. See? What is that saying to us? The fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and whoever wrote, they wrote about a life story or the account of the events of Yashua's life when he was walking the good way. And when they did not understand the Jews I'm talking about, your priests back there, they did not understand what he was doing. As a matter of fact, they didn't know who he was. They did not know he was their creator in a body. I don't even know the rest of the religious world knows it up to today. You see, that's a question I don't even know if they know that. The one who was speaking to them, who they were questioning, was the one who made the world. See, that needs to be seriously understood still in the world today. That Yahshua is Yahweh in a bodily form. See, and in the same John, see, it says he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. But yes, they did teach in the world, and they couldn't recognize the Savior of the world in the world. Because the law and the prophets was prophesying of him. And they had the books of the law and the prophets, and they missed him. How he used to come in, when he used to come in, the signs of his birth, they missed him. Yes, they know something, you see. So they think. So we have the law of the prophecy, and when they did not understand what he was doing, he told them what he was doing. And we get that in Matthew 5, 17 and what? 18. When they were criticizing him, he told them, think not that I am come 
to destroy the Lord of prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Have they understood the, word, the meaning of the word fulfill yet? A simple word like that. Have the religious world understood that? That the exact words that Yahshua the Messiah was, was saying back here to the world, that is here in the world to fulfill everything. All things that is written of him in the law and in the prophets and even in the Psalms concerning him. So all who like to read Psalms on somebody here, or for this purpose and that purpose, see, the Psalms don't even concern you either. See, the truth sometimes hurt. Because you say, for verily I sell to you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot, or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled, all of the law. And there are 613 of them, not, not just 10. And he said, he's here to complete them and bring them to a what? An end. Not to give us something, you see, on example, a Christian example to go follow the, the law and the prophets. That is man's doctrine. That is what they call erroneous doctrine. See? So here he is in the world and he's there for the purpose to fulfill everything that is written of him in the law and the prophets. So around this time, they tell you it's Easter. They're all wrong. Sad to say, they go wrong. Just like Ezekiel is saying, they start to worship all abominable things and idols and imagery to provoke Yahweh to jealousy and behaving as though they have the power over the whole world. See? That's, and he's, he's showing Ezekiel in a vision how they behave it. So everything that is taking place today is on time. It's already recorded. So the question is, since Yahweh Elohim, through his son Yahweh the Messiah, didn't give anybody an Easter, where did this come from? See? And you will find out it has come from pagan worship, satanic worship. But then somebody would say, but look, you see some words in the Bible that relates to it. No. What you see in the Bible does not relate to your Easter. I took you here already in a previous lecture that when the children of Israel, before they were delivered, had failed from Egypt after Yahweh had devastated Egypt with ten devastating plagues. The ninth plague was the plague of darkness, and the tenth plague was the plague of, plague of death. See? And remember, in that lecture, it showed how Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart and softened until he eventually got power over all the deities. All that Pharaoh and his people served for power. He showed that they had no power. All these deities or gods or whatever you want to call them, that they were serving, he made sure he sent a plague that represented what their power was all about. 
the thing was not randomly done to show that he's king over all the earth. There's none like him. So with that, she did part of the child is painted black to represent Egypt. This part here represents the Red Sea. See, this part here is the River Jordan. This part here, the wilderness of Sinai. This part here, Canaan's land. See? That's what it represents. So here he is, and he sets up, remember, he set up the Passover Memorial Feast of Supper with the children of Israel, Moses and the children of Israel. See? And for those who might be new to it, we will pick that up in Exodus, the 12th chapter. So what they have done is many people feel, see, that the Passover Memorial Peace or Supper that was given to the children of Israel has a link to their Easter. That is not correct. That is the feeling that they have given us. It's only a feeling. There's no reality to it. So when we go back in the 12th chapter of Exodus, and it says, Yahweh speak unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Now, it could be interpreted a different way. See? But this leaves no real interpretation. This is what it says, is what it is. That the Yahweh spoke in the land of Egypt, saying, in other words, Yahweh is in Egypt speaking to Moses and Abraham. See, your superstition in your head would, may not make you understand that. That the one you call God is in the land of Egypt in a physical body speaking to Moses and Aaron. That's what the book says. See? And he said unto them, the second verse, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month to you. See? And Exodus 13 and 4 says, this day came me out in the month in Amen. Do you know? We are in the month of April. We are in what we call April. April corresponds to Amen. See? So April 1st was the first month of the year. In other words, the first of April was your New Year's Day. For those who celebrate New Year's, that is the true New Year's Day was the first of April. Not January. And here in the 12th chapter of Exodus, it where Yahweh sets up the Passover memorial feast and supper with the children of Israel. He didn't start no Easter. See? See? He says, Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. The tenth day of the month, take every man a lamb. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb upon house. And if the house should be too little for the lamb, 
Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of his souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without what? Blemish. It must be a perfect lamb. It must have no spot, no blemish. A male lamb of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goat, and shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So he's telling them, he's giving them the Passover. He's setting up with Moses and the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. And he's distinct about it. He's particular about it. See? Why? Because he has to come in. 1500 years after this, he's going to come in and fulfill it. So when we understand the one who's coming in to fulfill it is the one who gave them it, we might be able to understand the scriptures a little better. Hmm? That he, he's the one who gave them it, and he's the one who brings it to them. See, that might be difficult to understand by the kind of programming we have had over the years and centuries. See? And he tells them how to have this Passover. And he said, this, take the lamb, see? Pierce the lamb in the side. Why the lamb has to be pierced in the side? Because he has to fulfill it. He has to complete it and bring it to end exactly how he gave them it. Because it's he who's given them it in the land of Egypt. This time he's that big. Put on some big clothes. See? It's time we pick up to put on some adult clothes in our mind. See? Because we could only be fooled if we want to be fooled. See, if you're ready to be fooled, there's always someone to fool you. See? You say, take that land, pierce it in the side. So when you pierce it inside, blood going to come up. Say, take a basin. Pour the blood in the basin. See? And take a kiss of weed and strike it. Strike the blood and the front of the door, which is called the lid, with two side holes and the rest of the blood in the basin to be held. And he said, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Because the plague of death is going to be on the land of Egypt. See? On all the males, man and beast, who does not have the blood in their doorway, the death angel will pass and kill them. See? No superstition. So it's very particular. See? And it says in the Bible. See? We read in the 12th chapter of Exodus. And it shall strike, shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side doors and on the upper door doors of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Roast with fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter fruits. They shall eat it. So it's two things to eat and one thing to drink. It's a menu. 
and then take it according to the amount you could eat. See? It's a meal because they have to travel a three-day journey. So they have to have sustenance in there. See, it's not nobody resting something on your tongue. Eat not of it raw, not, not all with water, but roast with fire his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, he shall build with fire. Say, don't let it remain. And say, this is the way you're supposed to eat it. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins to it, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in his, it is Yahweh's Passover. You will have in your King James Version, it's the Lord's Passover. It didn't say it was Easter. See? He said, and I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods or deities of Egypt will I execute my judgment. I am Yahweh. You will have, I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plagues shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to you throughout your generations. This is good, eh? Nobody else was invited to this part of a memorial piece or supper. Nobody else, no generation, other than the children of Israel generation, was given this. Throughout your generation. And you shall keep it in peace by an ordinance forever. In other words, that's the law. An ordinance is a law forever to the Jews. Seven days shall he eat unleavened bread. Even the first day he shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So anybody who's eating leavened bread, and what is leavened bread? Bread that has something in it to make it dry. You must eat that. And we eat in bread that rises today. Hmm? If we say we keep in the law, or we copy in these things, we shouldn't even be eating bread that rises. To show you, the Gentiles is just messed up. And in the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be an holy convocation to you. No man of both shall be done in them. Save that which every man must eat, that only may be done to you, done of you. Not only was, was it a Passover, but it was also a Sabbath or a rest. So what we have in here in the conversation, Yahweh speaks to Moses, Moses goes and speaks to the children of Israel. That is what's taking place. 
When Yahweh gave Moses and Abraham the instructions, then you will see it will be repeated back to the children of Israel. See? So that is what we find taking place. Since Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take up your land according to your families and kill the Passover. See? And he goes on to tell them how they must take it, what they must do, how they must take the bunch of it up with, and he shall take a bunch of this up and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel, the top of, which is the top side post, the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the house None of you shall go out at the door of this house until the morning. So when they had to have this Passover, they were told, don't go out of the door. Don't leave the door. So you couldn't have this Passover in a church, in a synagogue, in a mosque. Hmm? Even if you wanted to have it, there was no religious building that was prescribed for it. You have to eat it in your house. That's the law. See, and it goes, and Moses is telling them, and they shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever, not the Gentiles. So the Gentiles never got a Passover. They were never invited to the Passover supper. No time at all. See, and even the Jews who had it, they couldn't leave the house. I will read this part for you. That's Exodus 12. And Yahweh said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat here, not even a stranger who is a Jew could eat it. Hmm? Because there must be an there was an requirement. But every man servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat the earth. He said, foreigner, and a hired servant shall not eat the earth. See, in one house shall it be eaten. You have to eat it in your house. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall he break a bone thereof. So you can't carry it out of your house. You can't take it. Because some people are made to feel this represents their communion that they have in the churches. Hmm? For somebody preached to them, you see, that the way for the youth, when they pray on it, it turns it into the body and blood of the Savior of the world. Well, that is what. Ezekiel was talking about. They're doing all abominable things and saying that Yahweh is not in charge of the world anymore. Hmm? Tell them, look, look different places and see the wickedness they're doing in my house. See, that wafer, that wrong this. It does not represent the Savior of the world. It represents the Son God. In different cultures, there are different names for the worship of the Son. So that wrong thing that is full of, and say they put it in your mouth, 
and it is the body and blood of the Savior of the world. That is an abomination. And on the YouTube, somebody, I do not know to what extent, but the message or how factual it is, but the message is important. One of the bloggers was saying that the scientist has informed the Vatican that in their wafer, there's no DNA to show that this is the body of the same of the world and the blood. But the message is clear what he's trying to, to tell the world. They're being fooled. And then you have another one who says, well, this is not the actual body and blood of the same of the world. If you be not that brave, tell the people that. You see, we will say it represents his body and his blood. Either way, it's all an abomination. See? And they take it and they cry all over the place. The truth, Passover, lamb could not be taken outside of your house. And it was not something you rest in your tongue. It was not some of them use cracker and grape juice. It's not that either. See, and you were not told. You had no part in it. It's only the Jews and the Jews alone. So that is why in Ezekiel, Yahweh took Ezekiel and showed him all these things going on in the world. All these abominations, all these wicked things in his sight. Even in the religious places, it was going on. So he gave them that Passover memorial peace or supper in the land of Egypt. See? You go to Ezra 6.19, Ezekiel 45.21, and you see the children of Israel continuing to have that Passover. So we have it in the law and we have it in the prophecy. So if we are knowledgeable of the fact that Yahshua the Messiah is the one who gave it and is the one who's going to manifest it and take it out of the way or fulfill it, then we look to him doing it. So you get Matthew the 26th chapter. And we start in the second verse. And Yahshua the Messiah will have his strength. Yahshua the Messiah have his 12 disciples. You see? And he said to them, and those who have the red letter edition, it will be written in red, which is his exact words to say. And he says unto them, You know, after two days, is the feast of the Passover. Now, if they come to set up the Passover for them to follow, then he had to teach them it, because he will be setting it up. But if they already know, he is setting up nothing. See? Because he said, you already know that in two days is the feast of the Passover. Why? Because he was keeping it throughout their generation. So 1,500 years after, they must know what to do. So they know the Passover is in the 14th. He didn't even have to tell them what they 
So they know they have to take out the lamb on the tenth day. Hold it over for four days. Which can be the four days. But that lamb must be examined. See? And he says now, that the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. See? Then I'll read this part for you. Then assembly assembled together the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people unto the place of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. See, these are your big boys. In those days, you big boy religious leaders. You see, your elders. You see, people who run, run things, they all got together. They got having a council. They have a meeting that they might take Yahshua by subtlety and kill him. Why? Because he's preaching the truth. And he's preaching it with authority that they don't have. They feel threatened. See? They come with to maintain power to have power. So they get together. How are we gonna how are we gonna get it? How are we going to kill that man? Because he's not subjecting himself to us. See? But he said, not on the feast day, this year be an uproar among the people. See? Then you had the woman with the alabaster box of ointment who anointed his body. See, this is not preached normally. So I think I'll bring it in. See? The sixth verse. Now when Yahshua was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at me. But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, What purpose is this waste for this ointment? might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Then Yahshua understanding, understanding itself unto them, why shall we eat the woman? For she had brought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she had for this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached, in the whole world there shall also this, that this woman had done be told for a memorial of See, wherever the gospel is preached, this must be said of this woman. That she prepared my burial by this ointment, expensive ointment that she poured on him. But something I looked at that is the disciples, they had indignation towards Yahshua when the woman 
was attending to him. See, and you must look up the meaning of indignation for yourself and see if you suffer with that. If you have that kind of thing in you, she, the disciples did not treat in their mind and in their spirit. At that time, they became very evil in the mind towards him because of the woman was anointed him. And everything that comes nasty came into their mind. See, because the woman was doing something in fulfillment of his barrier. Hmm? You must look up the meaning of the word for yourself. And this is his disciple. And now I could truly understand why they could have that, that indignation, that hatred, and that jealousy, and that envy. Only they was walking with him, and they was experiencing the power of Yahweh in him. Yesterday they had that. See, I could truly understand it. You must look at the meaning of the word indignation for yourself. See? Because it tells you that they did not have the Holy Spirit in them. And when one does not have the Holy Spirit, do you know how good and kind it is, these things are short. Even though you're good and kind to be, once you have, don't have the Holy Spirit, there are times these indignations or these evil spirit manifest themselves against you, even though you have with them. I have had those experiences myself. Mm -hmm. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went on to the chief priest and said unto them, What shall we, what shall he give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted, which means they made an agreement with him for thirty pieces of silver. See? And from that time he sought an sought opportunity to betray him. This is one of his disciples now. See? And it's always an inside job. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yahshua saying unto him, Where will thou that we, be, we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? She didn't have in the Passover. They're not celebrating Easter. Where will you well, when thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover. And he said, Go into the city to such a man and say unto him, The master said, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thine house with my disciples. No. He had it. When it started, it was in a house. He's fulfilling it, it has to be done in a house. Now, as we're reading about somebody who's criticizing these scriptures, and they say these scriptures show this, they say that that's erroneous scriptures, wrong scriptures. See? That's what that person is saying in their book. But strange enough, their contention is based on the fact that in the Greek, this means this and that means that. Yahshua is not a Greek. 
Yahshua was never a Greek. Yahshua was never speaking Greek. And none of these disciples were Greek. Huh? Yes. The way people hear. You want to show sure they know a different language. Yahshua wasn't speaking Greek. She all, all those other language came from the Tower of Babel. Hmm? Name one of them with the Tower of Babel, that's where that comes from, where he confounded the language. Yahshua never spoke Greek. See? And this is when you read out of the King James Version, it is written in red. The exact words of Yahshua Messiah. He wasn't speaking Greek. So when they want to confuse people, they start to say, this means that with the Greek. And the disciples did as Yahshua had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. See? Now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Master, Rabbi, is it I? See? And he said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Now what was happening around that table? After he said one of them is going to betray him, they became exceedingly sorrowful. See? And at that same time he said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the sub, the same shall betray me. So they so sorrowful, they was not looking to see who was dipping their hand in the sup alongside with it. Because at that time, Judas Iscariot's hand was in the sup with him. That's why he said that. See? But they missed it because they were exceedingly sorrowful and they weren't paying attention. He said, the Son of Man were, as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by which the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it that? He said unto them, Thou hast said it. And as they were eating, no, they say as they were eating, what were they eating? See, they have the part over here. And as they were eating, see? Yahshua took bread and blessed it and gave it, and break it and gave him it and gave it to the, to the disciples. So as they were eating, Yahshua took the bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples. So what were they eating? So as they were eating, Yahshua took the bread. Well, when it was started or instituted in Egypt, before they children of Israel came up. It was roasted lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. So the bitter herbs is really the juice of various bitter vines that are squeezed together. See? Made liquid here that they could drink. So the only other two things to eat 
is the bread and the lamb, the roasted lamb. So that as they were eating, so the Yahshua took the bread, so they were eating the lamb, the roasted lamb. Yahshua took the bread. If you notice something, they wasn't resting nothing on their tongue. Yahshua took the bread and blessed it and gave it the bread to them. Mm -hmm. To his disciples and said, Take, eat. So he's giving them the bread. He said, You take it, eat it. He said, For this is my body. See, for this, for this is my body. No, what they want me to believe that the Savior of the world did not know the difference between a piece of bread and his body. Because they're preaching today that he's saying the bread was his body. See? He never told his disciples the bread was his body. He pointed himself and said, this is my body. They have the bread. If he wanted to say, or if he said, that the bread was his body, you would have to say, that is my body. Because when you have something in your possession, you say, this is mine. When you lose possession of it, and you have to point to it or refer to it, you have to say, that is mine. Oh yeah, so he never said the bread was his body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink you what? All of it. See, and it's written in red, you know. He said, drink you all of it. So he gave them the cup that had the what? See, the bitter, the bitter juice in it. He gave them the cup did he tell them to leave back some until they build the Christian churches? Because at this time they have no Christian church. He said, leave back some and put it in a corner. So when the Christian church comes around, they will have. He said, drink you what? All of it. And I know they were obedient, so they would have drunk all. See, today they're still drinking out of the cup. Who's fooling who? Hmm? He said, so if you drink all that, it is stopped. For this is my blood, he didn't say that is my blood because remember they have the cup now when they passing it around. He didn't say that is my blood, he said this is my blood. Of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. No, right there tells you something too. Right there tells you not to mark, look and judge is not the New Testament. His blood. His atoning blood is what gave the New Testament power. See? For so this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. It is shed for many for, 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 for the forgiveness of sin. And the point of his blood, not what was in the cup. Because his blood is going to sac be sacrificed, his blood is going to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And by his blood, we are saved and cleansed from sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So you say, wait now. The drinking and the eating is going to be new 
in his father's kingdom. See, so if you are in the kingdom, you're supposed to be drinking and eating something new, not that. So what he's doing here is fulfilling. He's fulfilling that Passover memorial piece of supper that was given to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. So when we get to John, in fulfillment, at a time when we are to the one side, we I think we get on the chapter of Matthew. So in fulfillment, see, the lamb that was slain, see, we will have the actual being the lamb that was slain from even the very foundation of the world.
we got John 6. And Yahshua said to the multitude, Say, I am the bread of life. Your father did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Say, This is the bread that cometh down from heaven, that the man may eat the oil. And not that. He goes on to say, I am the living bread. Which came down from heaven, and if a man may eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give you is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world, for the life of the world. And the Jews, therefore, showed among themselves, saying, How oh, can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yahshua said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye shall have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is sweet indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I am. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me. Even he shall live by me. See, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not your fathers. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of my bread shall live forever. These things said me in the synagogue as he told them in Capernaum. And many people of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When you gather you in himself that his disciples know not, that if he said not to them, Let this offend you. What am I? You shall see the Son of Man ascending, ascend up where he was before. It is the Spirit that quickened him. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and man. No. See, this was grossly misunderstood. One of the things that has been grossly misunderstood and still is. And I heard somebody preaching this. See? And in fact, saying that Yahshua was telling them to eat his flesh. He did say, see? Because he was preparing himself for death. And he knew. When he finished with that, he's going to get all the hypocrites to run from him. You know that? He was riling them up. Because if they only knew, really knew who he was, and what he was really doing there, they would not have crucified him. But when you get people better, See, they lost all compassion, all reasoning. So when they heard these words that he said, eat him, him, his flesh naturally, they said, no, this is a hard thing. See? We can't follow this man. He's gone off. And if they knew it back there, That it is not something that anybody wants to do to serve 
the Creator. And they disperse from him many of them. How come now today? Somebody preaching exactly that. And the people run into it. But what he end up telling his disciples for them to understand what he was doing. He tell them it is the spirit that quickness. The flesh topic is what? Nothing. See? So if they even eat his flesh naturally, it's not going to profit their what? Nothing. So all those who say the eating and drinking of his body and the blood, the flesh topic is what? Nothing. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So what he's saying, those who eat enough him spiritually and drink enough him spiritually, they're the one who's going to get to get alive. Those who want the flesh, eating and drinking naturally, they got no eternal life to get. Because the flesh of it, what? Nothing. Your flesh, my flesh, everybody's flesh of it, nothing. In the spiritual realm. In the natural realm, yes, it's going to profit you. See? But not in the spiritual realm. See? You see, in the spirit, the flesh profit is nothing. It is the spirit that witness. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He said, but there are some of you that believe not. Remember when the children of Israel see, was going through the Red Sea, they ate and drank but they did not eat and drink naturally. They ate and drank up spiritually. For Yahshua knew from the beginning who they were that believe not, and who shall betray him. And he said, Therefore, said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it will give unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You see, he got rid of the hypocrites. See, he knew how to get rid of them. See, after he tell them about eating his flesh, many of them left him. They walked with him no more. Then says, Yes, go unto the girl. Will he also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Master. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Seek the words. She just like someone can speak words to you that will destroy your soul. The lies destroy your soul. Then he said, therefore said unto you. Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it will give unto him of my father.
and we believe and are sure that thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So the twelve disciples testified that they were sure that he was the Son of the living God. So we have Yahshua the Messiah, he is the bread of life that came down from heaven. That a man may eat the earth and never die. He said, I am the living bread. And he's the Lamb of Yahweh that take it away the sins of the world. So he's the bread, he's the Lamb. See? So then the time for him to fulfill the entire world of prophets. See? And he had that last pass over with them. And he said, I'm not going to eat or drink anymore of the fruit of this vine until I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So new means new. So that is why when Judas went unto the high priest and told him where Yahshua was going to be. And where was he? He was in the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. So you see, Judas now, and it was in the night, with the band, the high priest, and the elders, and the people, and they came into the garden in the night with the torches. And you just think about a group of people coming in, walking anywhere. Their bodies is going to be twisting and turning, forming that configuration of a serpent. Because they're not going to be walking in a straight line. So they're going to be swerving the band of people manifesting the serpent in the garden that took place when Eve was in the garden, Adam and Eve was in the garden. So they manifested that serpent and they come in into the garden. See? Because remember, sin started, sin manifests itself. I wouldn't say started because it started in heaven. But it manifested itself in the garden. See, in the old way. So now it manifests itself in the garden. And the actual size in the garden to take away the sin. See? So he's in the garden to take away the sin. That the first man had of no me. See? So here he is. And Judas came and betrayed him with a what? Kiss. See? So they led him away. And then they had to examine him. And Pilate, in examining him, examining him, he said, he washed his hands. He said, I want no part of this. This man is innocent. See, I find no fault in the land. Because Yahshua is the land of Yahweh that taketh away the what? Sins of the world. So just like when they had to examine the land, the Passover memorial of the land, he now is the true Passover land, and he has to be examined. And they have to find no fault with him. So he's fulfilling. See? Having done that now, and he's placed before the people, we find that the high priest and the elders of the people start to ask for Barabbas. Give us Barabbas, crucify us for the side. Hmm? See? So when that took place, 
and he was released into the hands of the Jews. See, they cause they the one your boys crucified him. And he was led away and they tortured him. The blood of common thorns, as I said. So that common thorns, as I said, Jew blood, that represents head, because remember, John Paul, he said, I am the door. So he's also the door. So they put the common thorns at his head, which true blood, his head represented the lintel of the door. See? For his door, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So he is the door, so his head is the lintel of the door. And enjoy true blood because the Passover memorial of his lamb, the blood was struck on the door, the top of the door. So he being that lamb, and he being that door, the blood was struck on it. Then the, the blood was put on the two side doors of the door, the only Egypt. So they must nail him in the left hand and the right hand. See, blood running, he's the door. See? And there must be, they must nail him in the feet, because he is the door. And back there, he's fulfilling that lamb back there in Egypt. And that blood was put on the door. He's fulfilling it to the church and to the temple. See? So after that, See? Remember the beating with pestles. So when he was out there on the cross, she after they gave him the bitter, the vinegar to, to, um, to drink. See? See that bitter herbs. Then he put his head in his gloves. See? The last thing he said it is finished. He's finished fulfilling the law of prophets, completing it, bringing it to an end. That's what it's all about. And has given us salvation by grace to faith. See? Then he was saved down of the cross, see, before the Sabbath day. For the Sabbath came in. And on the Sabbath, he was put in Joseph's new tomb, fulfilling that Sabbath in his death, not back in an act. And if we don't know what Sabbath means, no good. One day, we all will be in a position where we may never get up to work. See? So he is in Jordan to do on the Sabbath day, completing that Sabbath and in his rest as a sign, as I am the resurrection and the life. See, he was there for three days and three nights, and he resurrected the morning of the third day. Death, burial, what? Resurrection on the third day. That is not Easter. See, that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the actual Messiah, according to the Lord of the prophets. Not Easter. See, he tarried the third day for 40 days and 40 nights. He ascended to the Father 10 days later for the Holy Spirit. Which puts us in a spiritual age and dispensation. Not in the dispensation of the natural or the law, the physical law. We in the dispensation of the law of the spirit. 
not in the dispensation of the natural law. Or to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. He said, Push out therefore the old leaven, that we may be a new lamb, as we are unleavened. For even Yahshua, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us not keep the feast. Not with the whole level, neither with the level of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So the Passover now is spiritual. The bread now is spiritual. See, when we eat and drink you know, of the knowledge that I'm giving you, you eat and drink you know, of that blood. That bread, that spiritual bread, that spiritual knowledge. Because remember, when he was crucified, they had two men, one on either side of him. See? And remember, they said they passed over and went to Yahshua. So he's a, he's a true lamb of Yahweh that was sacrificed for us. See? Then the question you should ask yourself, where you get your Easter from? And in some of my notes that I've made, see? It says that Easter comes from the worship of Nimrod. It comes from the Assyrian, the Babylonian. It is the worship of Nimrod. It is the worship of Samaramas. Is the worship of Astoris? And it is the worship of Tammuz, all enshrining God. See? That's where you get it from. Steeped in Babylonian and pagan customs. And I urge you to go do some research and find out where you got to eat the from. What you call the Easter is not in your Bible. Just come together with what they call the Eucharist or the communion. And even that, See, not even the Jews 
Give me 1 Corinthians 11.20. And Paul speaking to the Corinthians said, When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper. The only time the Lord's supper appears in your Bible is his John eating. Paul is speaking to Corinthians, the Corinthians, first Corinthians, ten of the starting of fifteen years. I speak to what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of the Messiah? The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of the Messiah? For we being many are one bread. You see, the people is the bread now. Those with the Holy Spirit, they are the bread. For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread, which is we are all partakers of the divine knowledge. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifice, sacrifices, partakers of the body. But what is the idol? That the idol is anything. For well, that which is of Christ's idol is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice the devils and not the head of them, and I will not that you will share have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of Yahweh and the cup of devils. You cannot partake of Yahweh's table and the tables and the table of, of the devil. Do we provoke Yahweh to jealousy? Are we stronger than you? See? So the things that the Gentiles are doing, they will never give them to do. See? And it's all coming from Babylonia and satanic practices that have been incorporated or brought in to the Christian churches and the Christian religions. Please do pull up the 
Sì. Sì. Cioè da di lui un altro. Di Padova. Sì. 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 For all these religious people and elders, she did various religious places and they were provoking the hours. They don't want to do that. Doing every abominable thing and saying you're right. With these two words, I say hallelujah. And I thank each and everyone for listening today. You have a good day and stay safe.